sorry, we will start again from the second. Yeah, no, no problem, yeah, I think uh, maybe Microsoft were doing something with Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it might be. Uh, okay, how will you assess mathematical skills? Every subject of lesson is valid for this way of thinking. For example, physics, biology, and even history. But when we have teachers who can think like you, they don't match the demands of the Ministry of Education and the university exams, such as A-levels, SATs, and the worst case, the Turkish university exams. How do you solve this conflict of interest? What do you think of the current math exams in international exams, such as SATs or A-levels? So, what I believe about exams is that in the end, they have to be a good simulation of the real world. And I think current exams have one major problem in maths anyway, is that they don't use computers. And the real world has computers in it. So I think one big problem right now that we have to change is exams have to have computers in it. And kind of that's a major, you know, if you're taught all the way through using computers, it's kind of important that you can use them to solve problems in the exams too. Now I guess in Denmark they're doing some experiments with this, but not, not yet with maths. So that's, a, that's an issue. And, you know, in terms of the general level of exams, I mean, it's sort of hard to gauge. I think that some of them are pretty hard. Some of them are hard but for things that people don't usually use in life. And so they tend to select a funny group of people. But it's probably worth doing good. My, my belief about things is it's good trying to do stuff and under the, it's good trying to do well under the existing system. So it's worth trying to do well in the exams because that way you can criticize them more easily afterwards. I love your idea. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> nice to talk to you. When do you think your plan will function globally? Well, it's it's very hard to predict. I mean, I you know what I think will happen. I mean, I think education is going through a big transformation in how it's delivered. Maybe less in Turkey so far, but in the US things are starting to change and you know a lot of companies are doing things and as, as opposed to just governments. So I think what we'll see is you know perhaps the best way to change it is to have a separate subject that kind of competes with mathematics today. So let's say there's a computer based math subject and it tries to run the existing math subject out of business. So it's like, you know, people can decide which maths to take, whether they take computer-based maths or whether they take normal maths. And if we get those things started in different countries, I think if we, if we do it well, we'll eventually find everyone takes the computer-based maths. And the original mathematics, well, maybe a few people want to take that. You know, just like in Britain, various people study ancient Greek. But it's, uh, it's kind of a very niche subject and not the mainstream. So I think that's the way to do it. I think to have a separate subject that competes with the original subject. Thank you so much. And thanks. Nice, nice to talk to you. Nice to meet you too. Hi. Uh, I'm curious to know how successful you were in math class during your primary school and high school years. Did you come up with your way of thinking because you hated math when you were a child and you didn't want other students to go through the same things? Or as you grew up, you understood that the most of the things you had learned in math class were useless? Yeah, that's a, that, these are good questions. <clears throat> and amusing ones too. So, I was decent at maths. You know, I did decent, pretty well at maths. And, um, you know, I could, I could, I could do well. I, I was probably better at physics, actually, than maths. And I was a lot worse at French. So, <laughs> French is the sub, you know, you usually have to learn French as the first foreign language of if you learn stuff in the UK. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, <coughs> excuse me, I quite like that because I can kind of do quite well at it compared to other people. But, um, uh, it, um, uh, you know, so basically I, I like that. And I actually learned quite a lot from mathematics I did. But a lot of it I also realize now wasn't really very useful. But the, some of the ideas, the sort of way of thinking, I think I was lucky enough that I learned how to think mathematically. You know, I learned how to analyze. 
sense to learn, it probably did make sense to learn men if you wanted to do mathematics as a subject. Thank you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, what sort of famous mathematicians had difficulties in their school years? For example, Einstein failed in math, Newton was twice not accepted to university. Does this mean that the schooling system was wrong back then, or does math education start too early? Yeah, that's an interesting set of questions. So, I think, well, the first thing I would say is that educational systems usually follow the real world. They don't need it. So, I think schools and education has always been somewhat behind what's actually needed, you know, at least for many people. So I think that's sort of a, perhaps a thing that goes through many centuries. In terms of sort of the outliers, like the Einsteins or, or Newtons or whoever, I think they often, I mean, I think usually outliers like that, very brilliant people like that, don't fit into the institution very well together. Um, I mean, Newton was certainly a pretty weird guy. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's sort of the, the edge between being completely bonkers and being very brilliant. That usually doesn't fit very well in school. So I think there's always an issue with kind of people who think very, very differently having trouble with more standard schooling. Now, I, I also think that coming up, you know, with computers, we have real opportunities to have much more customized schooling. So instead of everyone sitting in a class learning stuff, you know, people can do more individual stuff for what, what, what they want to do and what they're interested in. And, you know, I think that's a kind of exciting future uh, to how things might work. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hello, Mr. Wolfram. Um, uh, what I want to ask is, our generation's learning uh, methods have changed. Uh, we learn more visually and with fast-paced uh, tools such as YouTube. Do you, see, do you see this trend as an asset or an obstacle for thinking, analyzing, or understanding math? What are the implications of this trend for creating new? New things? Yeah. Um, oh look, I, I think it's overwhelmingly a good thing. Mm. I mean, when you, I, I guess in the world's history of things, when we have new tools, you can use new tools in good ways, and of course there are always negatives of having new tools. But on the whole, exciting new tools, which, which the modern world of you know, interactive learning of all sorts, is, I think, on the whole, is overwhelmingly positive. Uh -huh. um, you know, I think, okay, so one thing is, I think we'll, by the way, see many more modalities of tool come up, not just, I mean, I, I know you only use YouTube as an example, that, of course, there's, you know, as you say, there's social networking and things, there are also things like interactivity. In fact, we're launching a thing called Computable Documents soon, which will allow people to sort of, the reader to kind of drive the, the example they're looking at. So we have an example of this on our demonstration site where you can actually go and play with examples. And maybe some of you guys can some, submit some new examples sometime. Um, but these are sort of new ways to communicate. And in a sense, what we're doing is we're connecting the author of the ideas much more directly with the, the reader or the, uh, the student or whatever. And that's got to be a good thing. Now, I also think another way I look at this, two other ways I look at this. One of the things that having equipment and automation things does for you is it allows you to split the method of what you're doing from the task. And I think, you know, I mean, I watched this with my young daughter who, for example, you know, the, the task of writing by hand and what she said, pretty separate things. Like, you know, when I was learning to write, there were typewriters, but there weren't really many computers. And so I didn't like type email messages. Now, you know, when you watch people now learning to write, they type email messages at the same time as they're learning to write. They're different skills. Typing, you know, writing, the physical thing of holding a pen and writing is a different skill for typing. And it's kind of interesting to see separating those different different modalities, uh, which I think is, is an interesting thing. Um, the, uh, I mean, the, the other thing I would say about that is, you know, I think of technology as like standing on the top of, you know, good technology is something where you're standing on the top of a, of a, of a hill and looking over the, the, uh, the plains. So, you know, if you're standing on the top of things, you can usually see further. And I guess that's how I view modern, modern technology that we have for learning.
All right, thank you. So, uh, one more question. Do you think, uh, can there be classes through YouTube in the future or right now? Teaching like... Yeah, YouTube and sort of more interactive. And in fact, um, there are a whole bunch of, uh, I think in the US, there are a whole bunch of uh, groups setting up to offer such such things. No, I mean, I think they could, I, I think people don't necessarily have to go to a class to learn. I mean, I think there are sometimes when you want to do that, but sometimes not. And, and it's interesting you ask the question because it's the same question when you're running a business. Right? How often do you actually need to physically be with them? actually in a meeting versus doing Skyping, for example? Um, it's strange, but there are still, it, it does make a difference when you're with people. But, but there are different cases where you can do things better by being sort of by yourself remotely. So I think we're sort of learning those different modalities. There are many different things we can do with computers. We can have experts beamed into classrooms talking about things, you know, where individual teachers might not have those skills, for example. Um, actually, one of the amusing things we've got in the company, we've just got one of these web-controlled robots. Um, I haven't actually really driven it yet, but the idea is, like, for example, I'm usually in the UK, much of our company is in the US. Uh, I can say hello to people around the office in the US remotely with the robot you see, as opposed to just, you know, I can like drop by at my desk. Um, I haven't tried this very much yet, but it seems like an amusing thing to try. Yeah, nice. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Wolf. Thanks. Hello, Mr. Wolfram. Hi. Uh, I quit science because there was no visual thinking involved, and most of the visual thinkers in school leave sciences. But when we look at careers of people on the world, we see a lot more lawyers than mathematicians. Uh, what do you think changes the world? For example, Hitler or Einstein or Obama or Zuckerberg? Oh my gosh, this is a, a, a big, uh, interesting philosophical question. So, look, I have to say, I'm afraid that good and bad people change the world. Not everything that, I mean, you know, terrible people who, who are around, you know, sometimes have in the end, some, some positive as well as negative side. So good and bad people change the world. Now, in terms of the subjects that people do, actually, I should ask, what subjects are you doing now that you've quit science? Like, I'm doing Turkish, most of like Turkish literature, and like, uh, like that, like math, ma mathematics and Turkish and English, most of based on languages. Okay, interesting, okay. I mean, some of to say, firstly, um, in terms of leaders, I think leaders of, of industry, of companies in particular, have got very much more technical in the last uh, 20 years. In fact, I mean, it was almost a joke, uh, even when my brother started with research, to have somebody with a PhD running a company. Uh, now, it's almost like, you know, it's strange if somebody who isn't at least technically educated in some ways running, running many of our large companies in the world. So that's a huge turnaround from when it was companies. And in terms of uh, people running countries, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting to note that the, you know, the current German, German Chancellor, Merkel, for example, has a, you know, is a physicist by origin. So I think even some of those things are, are changing. I, I don't really think it's... I think there are several things to combine here. I think it's uh, partly who decides to go into different subjects at different eras. And I think a lot of people will put off going into science, perhaps for the reason that you're describing, it wasn't visual, it didn't feel creative. And so at the sort of time when the current leaders were at school, that was certainly the case for, for science, and perhaps still is in some places. Um, so I think it's partly you know, who, what the intake is, and it's partly what the jobs demand. Now, of course, another thing to realize is the world is vastly more quantitative than it ever was before in all walks of life, not just running companies, but also increasingly running countries. And so people need to understand a lot more about how to analyze stuff technically than they ever did. And so I think, again, that will tend to push people who are more quantitative, um, you know, into those directions. Now, you know, I, the other thing I should say, though, is I think in the end, the people who succeed uh, different things and become leaders actually are people who get interested in stuff and are passionate about what they do. And in the end, whichever subject they happen to be excited about and what's important more than necessarily, you know, it's much more important to do a subject you're excited about, even if it seems a bizarre subject to do, you know, for any kind of practical purpose. It is to do a practical, apparently practical subject just because you thought that was, you know, what you were told.
you should do, so to speak. So I guess that's my way of thinking about uh, about life in that sense. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wolfram. I would like to say that uh, we will be very happy if you come to our school and visit us because you're an inspiration okay, well, for us. Okay, I appreciate the invitation. Thanks. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wolfram. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Wolfram. Hi. Um, you continually talk about the real life situations where computers can be applied. Um, my question is regarding some less fortunate, maybe even third world countries where computers cannot be found, where it's harder to find access to these kind of things. Um, we're kind of interested in whether you think it's more practical to invest aid money to teach them math through teachers, or to invest aid money to buy them computers and teach them through your method. Good question, though I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I mean, I think you have to do, to some extent, both. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, I suppose the way I think about this is computers enable new forms of, you know, teaching. Or, I, I wouldn't think, even teaching I find a slightly odd term, okay? Because teaching suggests, you know, one person telling somebody else what to learn, kind of thing. I mean, you know, teaching, investigation, kind of understanding, you know, education maybe is a better term. Um, now, I think a lot of that can happen in the future with, you know, computers and people discovering stuff for themselves. And, and in fact, somebody who was in the same session as me at, at my TED, when I gave my TED talk, a guy called Sir Siddhartha Mitra, believes in putting, I know he's done this in India, for example, he's put computers in the wall, basically, and students are given them a couple of questions to answer, and they just go off and search the web and figure out the answers and find out a lot of stuff. Um, I don't completely agree with him. That's the only way you should do things. I think you do need some kind of formal teaching, too. But I think there's a lot further you can go. In terms of estimating computers, um, what's difficult is it's, it's really coming up with the right materials and the right way of using those. I think that teachers are very important in, in, in making that work, but not in perhaps the traditional way they've been doing. So I think, I think you'll immediately get a, a big sort of a big result from investing in, you know, a sensible amount of technology with some sensible ideas about how to apply it. But I think you've got to invest in some teaching way of doing that to, uh, to help students as well. I don't think you can really just decide that computers can take over in that sense. And in fact, one of the mistakes in the sense that governments have often made is they've decided that somehow they can save money by having computers rather than teachers. So what they've done is they've then got computers to do the most conventional, imaginable thing, you know, not actually do calculating, for example, but just ask multiple choice questions and help students answer those. And then the whole thing degenerates into a kind of, you know, uh, ro robot-like world in which nobody's really learning anything of much value. So I think that's a danger, but we can avoid that danger too. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Thanks. Hello, Mr. Wolfram. Hi. Uh, do you believe every person has the same perspective of math and numeral thinking? For example, I think there are some people who generate their own algorithms and some others who are bound to a single form of algorithm and who can think very fast. Yeah, I think that people have innate skills that are different. And, you, you know, there's always this uh, debate about nature versus nurture. You know, how much of that is your genetics versus your upbringing versus, you know, other things that uh, that, that surround you in life. Um, and I think it's a mixture of both. So, I mean, I think, look, some people, it's, I think both societally and probably genetically, some people are more, think more in a mathematical way and some people think more in a, you know, in, in different ways. But I think, nevertheless, I think both sides of the end of that can be helped. And I actually think what I've been suggesting, um, you know, helps both ends of it. I mean, I think there are a lot of people, a slightly different answer to your question, there are a lot of people who currently don't do maths, because what they perceive maths as being is calculating, and they're no good at manually following procedures to calculate things. I think there are a lot of other people who are innately perfectly good at quantitative ideas and thinking about the world in a scientific way, but they're kind of put off doing that because of uh, because of how maths is set up. So I, I suppose not everyone is perhaps that way, but I think people, many more people than the current set, could be going 
much further in their kind of way of thinking about mathematics than, than the current system allows. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, so we discussed at length your car example you mentioned in your TED talk. You say, oh, yeah. we, do, you, you say we do not teach people who drive cars the details of the car parts. What's the objective of math? Are you saying take the car, i.e. math, and drive somewhere new, so use math as a tool to get to new findings? Or, you say, are, or are you saying take the car, i.e. math, and make another car? Or let me explain it further. Are you saying math is a tool and you need to use it to get to new places, like people who use computers and don't know how it works, so use math in other areas? Or math is imagination and you don't have to learn, memorize the intricate details to make it work. The computer does it. Understanding math is enough. Also, I would like to, like to explain better uh, with the example of string theory. Uh, the theory is that if you bend time enough, uh, you, sorry, if you bend time enough, you can see yourself in time. Uh, so, are you saying that if we implement the using math uh, ph physics idea, we can use the string theory to analyze a, a past genocide, or better, to jump to an old star, or even better, to see the creator of the universe? Here, the concept of math is to use it somewhere else. But how, but do we add anything to math itself? Also, or B. We can use string theory to make new the uh, to make new theory. Understanding is, it is enough. The brilliance of string theory is the in the idea behind it. The computer does all the calculations anyway. But aren't you contradicting yourself with the point uh, with this point? Because wouldn't you cause people to stop questioning math? For example, get uh, to get to know four plus four, we first have to know one plus one, vice versa. Uh, and most yeah. This is, this, this is a deep and good question, okay, or set of questions, I should say. Let me think about which way around to, to answer this best. Look, at some level, I think that the answer, so you kind of got to ask, what's the purpose of life? Okay, that's uh, generalizing your question even further. You know, what do you want to get out of life? What do you want to get out of education for life? Now, you know, at one level, education is a practical thing to enable you to, you know, function in the economy and so forth. And at another level, it's, it's a system of, you know, it's, it's a way to help you enrich your life. And I think both of those are important in different ways, in a different, you know, different setups. What I think doesn't work is to try and tell somebody that they have to be enriched by a subject which they don't really care about. So, you know, when people are told, you know, maths is enriching, you must learn maths because it's very good for you. If you happen to be interested in maths, and in all forms of maths, including how it gets calculated, that's fantastic. So, I guess here's what I'm saying. Well, one way to, if you want to, let's take the car analogy first. Um, you know, the most people in the world, in terms of cars, need to learn how to drive them. They don't need to learn how mechanics work, how to service them, or, or indeed how to become automotive engineers to build new kinds of cars, to design new cars. Um, so I don't think you should start teaching people about cars by teaching them about, or at least teaching them the mainstream subject there is driving. Now, that's absolutely not to say that if somebody gets interested in the mechanics of cars, how does a car actually work? You know, how does the fuel injection system work? How is that designed? How do I service it? Those are fantastic subjects, and anybody who gets, starts to get interested in that should absolutely pursue that as far as they want. And you know, and they may turn into the world's best, you know, um, uh, automotive engineer. That's fantastic. We need people to build new cars, but it isn't the majority of people who are going to be doing it. It's a very small minority who happen to get interested in that subject. Now, if you if you translate that to mathematics, you know, the mainstream subject. Is computer-based maths, in my view, where the, the, the point of mathematics is to help you to get to some other place, to help you drive your car to new and exciting places, and to use your car to, to explore the world. Now, some of the people who get excited about that will then start asking questions much more about, you know, how do you do the calculations? How do you do them by hand in the past? What's the history of hand calculating, as I call it? Or indeed, how does the computer figure out how to do it? If I want to make a computer do new kinds of calculations, how you know, should I get it to do that? Um, I think if people start to ask those questions, get interested in that, they absolutely, you know, that's a great subject that they should push on with. And 
they'll become some of the people building tools like Mathematica, for example, our Mathematica software system. So I think one thing I'd say like, that, that's important to distinguish is what the majority of people should do and what people who get excited about the subject should do. Now, there are, uh, just, you know, there's an even more detailed question, perhaps, than that, which is, in fact, uh, somebody who lives in the village I live in in England makes lutes. So those are those instruments, a little bit like guitars, very ancient yeah. instruments. And he was saying to me, you know, if you think about music, if people are never exposed to music, you know, how could they know that there's anything exciting there, so to speak? And I think a little bit the same about mathematics, but I think if you expose people to computer-based mathematics, which I think is also useful for them and conceptually interesting for many of them, the people who are interested in how that all works and what the innards of that are will self-select. They'll decide those are, those are exciting subjects, they'll pursue those, and they should then be helped. So, for example, at universities, I think absolutely we should have, you know, numerical analysis courses or, you know, how you build a computer system that does mathematics courses. Those are fine at that sort of level or indeed whatever people want. But that's not where I would start people, you know, at primary school or even at secondary school. So anyway, I hope that's some answer on the on the car thing. It's a pretty deep question and frankly one that, that doesn't get asked uh, very much around the world when, you know, particularly politicians and things are thinking about education. Mm, thank you, Mr. Conrad. Thanks. Thank you. That was very much expected and it's been, the gossip has been around the school that we were going to interview you and these were the lucky eight kids who, who were able to sit in. Well, well listen, I, I really appreciate these are, you know, these were really hard questions, which is great. Okay, I like hard questions. They were very interesting and deep questions, much more interesting than I get from, uh, from most people, for sure. Um, so uh, you made me think about some things here. So. Um, it, it's great to have that um, that interest and, and well and this creative thinking, which is partly what I what, what I'm talking for. about. So, I know, I know. Um, I mean, we were very, very excited to hear your TED speech, and I think you probably cannot imagine how much it's how long it has been talked about. We had it in different classes, and um, it went around uh, to different teachers, and it really it was an inspiration. Maybe not to some math teachers. Um, but uh, a lot of the kids, a lot of the students were very, very much inspired and really, I mean, some of the students here hate math and they were very excited to hear it and they kept on going, well, yes, this is what I mean, <laughs> kind of a uh, reaction. Well, so. it's, it's so, look, what's really nice is to see creative thinking about 